On July 6th of 2016, at 9.05 p.m., Diamond Reynolds was a passenger in her fiancé, 32-year-old Philando Castillo's car, along with her four-year-old daughter, Diana. They were headed home from an evening of work and running errands, which included grocery shopping. The three had just taken Diamond's sister home once they were finished at the store. On their way home and less than three miles away from their front door, tragedy would strike, changing not only their lives, but the lives of everyone around the nation. Now, before I proceed, let's understand the context of the events and what this video is and is not about. Philando Castillo was known as a beloved school cafeteria worker who had a caring and positive impact on the lives of countless children. He was a responsible gun owner, so he informed Officer Geronimo Yanez about his legally carry firearm during the traffic stop. Despite his compliance, the situation escalated tragically. This culminated with him being murdered in front of his fiance and daughter. This video will not totally focus on that aspect of the tragedy. I've already covered that in the three-part series that you should check out after this video. But what I will be covering today is the police interview given to Diamond nearly three hours after the shooting. Diamond Reynolds courageously started streaming the tragic aftermath on Facebook Live. Philando lay dying right next to her on camera in front of millions of people. The officer's gun still pointed at his head. It was supposed to be a routine stop and identify traffic stop. Diamond's account of the events and emotions shared during the police interview sheds light on the deeply distressing circumstances surrounding the murder. We will analyze Diamond Reynolds' interview with detectives and see firsthand how the events of that night will have lasting psychological consequences. The footage will give us an unfiltered look into the traumatized mind of a survivor. During the interview, Diamond will talk about how Philando was following the officer's instructions, attempting to comply and alerting the officer about his legally owned firearm. Her words are a stark reminder of the emotional toll that these incidents take on the families and loved ones of the victims. Diamond's interview offers a crucial perspective on the power dynamic between law enforcement and civilians during high-stress situations. It highlights the importance of empathy, de-escalation, and the necessity of having unbiased judgment on the part of the police. Her interview underscores the necessity for law enforcement agencies to prioritize transparency and communication and the damage not upholding their oath can have on the general population. Governmental failure and historical racism lay at the heart of this interview. It also speaks to the need for improved training in handling diverse situations without resorting to violence. Please stay informed about your constitutional and state rights. Engage in discussions about police reform and support organizations that work towards fair and just policing practices. Together, we can drive change. Don't forget to subscribe and tap the notification bell for more insightful content. Explore our other videos to partake in engaging discussions. Stay informed, stay fearless, and let's make a difference together. Let's get started. Diamond was brought to the police station for questioning once it was determined she was a witness and not a co-conspirator. However, her personal belongings such as her keys, money, and purse were not returned to her at the time of this interview at 11.22 p.m., two hours after the shooting of Philando. At the same time, Diamond's cell phone had not been returned to her because she used the phone to stream a live video of the shooting. The phone was considered evidence. I can't go anywhere. I don't have any property. They took my phone, my keys, money. Okay. Uh, I just want to get to regions where he is. Since y'all not telling me what's going on. Yeah. Hi, nice to meet you. The first red flag is the fact that neither detective introduced themselves formally to Diamond or even given her their names in the lead up to the interview. 
The black detective and Diamond never spoke or seen each other before they sat across from each other at the table. During interrogations and interviews, it's customary and the respectable thing to do. It's quite common and seen as good manners, even at a party setting, to introduce yourself by giving your name. So it's certainly strange not to do so when you're about to question someone and ask them to share their most traumatic event in their life. Because they fail to identify themselves properly, I have to refer to them as two detectives, or as the black detective and the white detective going forward. Hi, good to meet you, Diamond. Sorry about all this circumstance. I think they brought a black guy in here because I said that they're racist. No, this is my job. Okay. I work for the state. We both work for the state. Our Absolutely. job is to investigate this. So okay. it's just the luck of the draw. I'm, I'm okay. the one who showed up. All right. Even after such a condemning statement made by Diamond when she said, I think they brought a black guy in here because I said they were racist. The black detective failed to at least identify himself by name, but he did so by saying, I work for the state, as if it's a way to come off as some sort of authority figure and not a person. This power dynamic will become much clearer as what should be an interview, but instead comes off more of an interrogation continues. Uh. So, date is Wednesday, July 6th, the time is 11, 21 hours. Correction, 23, 21 hours. And this is in regards to BCA case number 2016. 433. Dash 433. And, uh, Diamond, you gave me your name already, but I'm just going to go ahead and state that for the record. Diamond, uh, is it Larray, L-A-R-A-Y-E, last name Reynolds, common spelling, your birthday is July 14, 1989. That is correct. You and uh, your boyfriend, who you refer to as Phil, uh, reside at 970 Rainy number 3, uh, in St. Paul 55106, is that right? Correct. And your cell phone number is 651-529. 4475, right? That is correct. Okay. And uh, Phil's last name is Cast Castillo. Castillo, and that's spelled C A S T I L E. His birthday is 716, and we think it's 1981, and he's just about to turn 35. So. That is correct. Okay. The date already stated is July 6th. So, can you just tell us what happened tonight? The very first question the white detective asked Diamond in regards to the shooting was, can you just tell us what happened tonight? I want you to remember that the detective are sitting across from a mother who, along with her 40-year-old daughter, only hours ago witnessed the murder of her fiancé in front of their very eyes by someone they work with. Not only does this and many future questions lack even the smallest bit of empathy, the detective's tone will match the cold, bare, and lifeless room they're all sitting in. Yes, absolutely. We were heading westbound down Larpener, uh, coming back from dropping my sister off from coming back from a long day of work. As we're heading west down Larpenter, I didn't notice that we were being pulled over because my head was down in my phone. I look up and see that there's lights flashing behind me. We pull over to the side immediately. The officer gets out of his car. One officer is on the right side of me. One officer is on the left side. The officer on the left side, which is right. the, driver's side. the driver's side, which is the driver's side, seemed very jittery from the time he walked to the car. He asked my boyfriend, Hi, sir, did you know that your back tail light was out? My boyfriend stated, No, I didn't know my back tail light was out. And then the officer, However, do you have license and registrations? My boyfriend stated, Yes, however, I do have license and registrations. He said, Can you put your hands up in the air, please? And then he said, can you pull out your license and registration? My boyfriend said, officer, I have a gun on me. And before he can do anything, he said, don't reach. But he was already supposed to be reaching for his license and registration. And in the process of him reaching for his license and registration, he's telling the officer, officer, I do have a 
a firearm on me and he's saying well now he said now that my boyfriend told him that he has a firearm on him as he was reaching for his registration and his license which is in his back pocket the gun was in his way and he wasn't able to get to his license and registration and the officer already with his gun blazing cocked and everything don't move don't move boop, 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 and took off and that was it now, if you were paying attention to Diamond's choice of words when describing the lead up to the shooting, you may have picked up on the fact that many of the words and how she organizes them within her sentences don't come off as her natural way of speaking. This is because she may not want to come across as uneducated to the detective, seeing as to how little personal rapport they built in the lead up to this interrogation and how unconcerned with her mental well-being the detectives have shown. This is compounded by the fact that she views police and the entire policing apparatus as racist. She's very familiar with the stereotypes many white institutions have for women who look like herself and the poor black community as a whole. She's code switching, but that won't last very long. And you were sitting in the passenger front seat. That is correct. And where was Deanna sitting? In the back car seat. Okay. Um, when the officer came to the car, she unbuckled her seatbelt okay. and began to move around in the back seat, asking for food because we had just came from daycare and work in the grocery store, as they can see the groceries in the front. And she went to start reaching for the halls that were on the back floor. And the officer stopped looking at my boyfriend as he was telling him to get his license and registration, started looking at my daughter. And I told my daughter instantly, stop moving, stop moving, stop moving. And then that's when the officer would draw his attention back to what he really was originally focused on. Now, the statement Diamond just made about telling her daughter to stop moving never happened at that point during the traffic stop. Her saying that it did could be due to a number of reasons. Typically, when people more specifically women recount or retell events, they include how they felt within the moment or how their emotions are interpreting the past event and totally not the exact way things transpired. Another reason for making this statement about telling her daughter to stop moving was because it did happen. She did say to her daughter, stop moving. However, it was after the shooting took place. Okay. So was the uh, officer on the driver's side? No, as soon as the officer on the passenger side began to start yelling, don't move and all that, the other officer, I looked back and he was gone. He was out of clear sight. He was nowhere to be found. Okay. Were both windows open, the passenger windows? All of the windows were open. Including the back seat? All of the windows. My daughter was moving around in the back seat, like I said, and he shot. As my, he asked my boyfriend for license and registration, as my boyfriend was reaching for his license and registration, he was having some difficulties. So he let the officer know, I have a firearm on me. And then that's when the officer was like, well, don't move, don't move. And as he's trying to get himself back comfortable, boop, 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 just like that. Here when Diamond explains what happened after the shooting, she states that the officer on the passenger side, identified as Officer Joseph Kaiser, began to yell, stop moving, stop moving. But it wasn't that officer making the commands, it was Officer Geronimo Yanez on the driver's side who shot Philando that yelled the phrase, stop moving. But when the shooting took place, the officer on the passenger side did run for cover. About four or five shots, back to back. His whole arm popped off. At the start of the interview, Diamond was really subdued and focusing on her choice of words, but each time she has to recall the exact moment of the shooting, she becomes really animated and very loud, mimicking the sound of the gunshots. This shows the extreme intensity of the moment and how deeply etched into her mind it became, which is understandable considering she was sitting less than three feet away from her fiancé as he was being shot at point-blank range. Regardless, hearing her rendition is still quite jarring, even to the detectives. Here she says his whole arm popped off, which certainly didn't happen. However, his arm did receive significant damage as the bullets went through his left arm and into his chest and abdomen. 
Regardless, his arm definitely didn't come off. But in fairness, from her perspective and the intensity of the situation, it may as well have, considering the catastrophic damage his arm did receive from the officer's bullets. This is Phil. Yeah. Did uh, Phil actually reach his firearm? Did he get no, it? he didn't even get it. It was still stuck inside his pants. He wasn't even able to pull it out. Okay. Can you describe how pants here? No, he has it. He has because it's in a holster. So he has it inside of his pants right here, and then he has the holster part, the metal part, over his belt. So you got to, like, wiggle it to get it from get off being hooked onto the belt. You know what I'm saying? So he wasn't able to do much. That's why when the officer was like, license and registration, he would notice himself having some difficulties. And that's when he told the officer, I have a firearm on me. And I'm like, he's licensed to carry. And then that's when he's like, don't move, don't move. Boop, 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 boop. But he didn't even let us get a, tell him nothing before he could really, I was just so, I'm trying to say everything at once. I instantly hopped on Facebook because I wanted to get it live. I want America to, to see how police react in situations without giving people the option to decipher or if, if you're pulling me over for a tail light, why would you be nervous? Why would you be jittery? Why would you be antsy? And if people are allowed to have firearms and also concealed to carry, then why does that give you the right if you're asking, let me see your license and registrations, put your hands in the air, how can you do two things at one time? How can you get your license and registrations and put your hands in the air? at the same time. It's either you want me to put my hands in the air to make you feel comfortable or you want me to follow the rules what you're just telling me. And he shot. Boop, 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 boop. And why did it take for that many times for him to shoot somebody blatantly in front of two women like that? Diamond makes quite a few crucial points in such a short time frame because of her adrenaline. But nonetheless, the points are valid and need to be analyzed. First, when Philando told the officer he had a licensed firearm within his vicinity, the officer should have asked, where's the firearm? As far as he knew, the gun could have been in the glove box or trunk. Second, it's become very obvious with the implementation of body camera footage that when officers are in high stress situation or are nervous, they sometimes, without realizing it, give conflicting commands. The suspect, not knowing which command to follow, tend to do neither not out of unwillingness to comply, but out of the confusion of which command to follow. Doing the wrong thing at the wrong time could be a death sentence. Third, Diamond asks why would the officer shoot him when he was with his woman and his child? Typically, society view men who are with their children as less of a threat because a man's natural instinct would be to protect their child, not robbery or assaulting someone. So much so, serial killer Gary Ridgway, who targeted prostitutes, will show them pictures of his children in order to ease their suspicion of him as he drove them to their deaths. For no apparent reason, because he was having hard times getting to his license and registration. Uh, does he have a public carry? Yes, he does. He has license, he has insurance, he has license to carry, he works for St. Paul Public Schools, he's been working for St. Paul Public Schools for well over 10 years, he doesn't have any kids, he's the only son of two kids, his sister was on the scene, um, he's never been arrested, fingerprinted, handcuffed, he has no criminal history, he is a good man, he's a good, he's not a gang member, gang affiliated, he goes to work and he comes home. His birthday's next week, he just left from getting his hair done, from being at work all day at school with the kids. Philando and Diamond told the officer before he opened fire that he had a license to carry and wasn't reaching for the firearm. In the state of Minnesota, this is quite common. There's no obvious lethal force reason for the officer to open fire knowing that carrying a licensed firearm within his state is totally legal. Philando's family were present next to him in the car and he was restrained by a seatbelt. He had no tactical advantage to open fire upon Officer Jerron Moyanes, even if he wanted to. And it was clear from their interaction that he had no desire or need to either. To come home from picking me up, me complaining to him for being not being where he's supposed to be, where I needed him, to come home, drop my sister off, 
do a favor, get some groceries, and then get cute for a shot, whatever y'all not telling me, I don't, I don't want to think he's the worst right now, but because it was a white officer and we are black in a community where there is really no justice, he blatantly shot his feet, fired his arm without proper protocol. Diamond doesn't know Philando was pronounced dead almost immediately when he arrived at the hospital. But soon the detective will reveal the heartbreaking news to her that he is in fact dead and it will be devastating. Whose car was it? My boyfriend's car. Okay. It might be registered to his mom's name though. Okay. I'm not sure about that, but I know it's my boyfriend's car. Was, uh... Was there any uh, illegal drugs or controlled yes, substances? Yes, we happened? smoked marijuana. Okay. There was marijuana in the car. Okay. Yes, we are smokers. That's uh, it. Okay. Um, what time did this happen? Do you have any idea? This happened um, right before 9 o'clock. I left the grocery store. He picked me up around 7.45. We went to the grocery store. We left out of the grocery store around 8.30. We was over there um, at, on Larpen around 9.45 is when it, about 8.45 is when it happened. Right before 9 o'clock because my sister was buying me some groceries because I didn't have food in my house and she was telling me I have to be somewhere before 9 o'clock. I have to be somewhere before 9 o'clock. And we made it. We were just to her house before 9 o'clock. How long have you and Phil been together? Ten years plus. Okay. Been together for ten years. Okay, that's a romantic relationship? Yes. Okay. Diamond says her and Philando were together for ten years. However, her daughter is four, and it's been widely reported that the child is in fact his stepdaughter. It may have been a ten-year on-and-off-again relationship or perhaps they've just been acquaintances with over ten years of knowing each other before they explored a relationship together. And although he's not Deanna's... No, he's not. He cares for her. He takes care of her, pick her up from I work two jobs. Okay. He works one job. I leave one. He picks me up from my first job. He takes me to my second job, and he picks my daughter up from daycare and watches her while I work my night job. Okay. Where do you work? I work at the Embassy Suites Hotel. Okay. And I will also like a statement because I will not be able to go to work. What time do you work? I work tomorrow at 8 in the morning. And then I work my second job at Family Dollar tomorrow at 4 p.m. Family Dollar? Yes, I won't be able to go to neither one. Which one is that? Midway. Midway, okay. Um, the Embassy Suites downtown St. Paul. Okay. How long, so you were stopped, a traffic stop was made? There wasn't even a traffic stop. We were so in plain pulled, sight. We pulled, got pulled, pulled over. over. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what I meant. Okay. So, and then... Uh, Two officers came at the same time? Yeah. The, okay. No, this officer came first, the one with the gun, the one who shot my boyfriend. So the driver's side officer came first? Yes. And then the passenger side officer came? Came after. How much Like, after? I'll say 60 seconds after he oh, walked up. A full minute? Yeah. And then during that minute, what was the conversation that was happening? He said that, I, we, do you know why you're being pulled over? He said no. He said, your back tail light is out. Did you know your back tail light was out? He said, no, officer, I didn't know my back tail light was out. He said, do you have license and registration? He says, yes, I have license and registrations. As he's going to reach for his license and registrations, he's having some difficulties. He lets the officer know he has a firearm on him. As he's having the difficulties trying to get his hands back in the air, the officer states, stop moving, stop moving, as he's trying to get back comfortable and let off shots. The other officer walked away. He disappeared miraculously. The one on the driver's side? The one on the passenger side. Oh, that's the one that disappeared? Yeah, the one on my side, okay. which is the passenger side, he disappeared. The one on the driver's side was just there the whole time. Like, ma'am, don't move. Ma'am, oh, my God. Oh, I can't, I can't believe it. Oh, yeah, you can't believe it, sir, because you did it. This time, when retelling the events and the officer placement relative to the vehicle, Diamond gets it right. The white detective notices her contradiction from the first time she was asked to give her side of the story. She reiterates correctly where the officers were positioned and which officer gave the command to Philando to stop moving. Does that happen after the shooting? Yes. Is that about when you started filming? Yes. 
That's exactly when I started filming. Okay. What job does uh, Phil do for St. Paul? He works in the cafeteria. He runs the, like, um, a dietitian aid, dietary aid type deal. Yep. Does all the computer work, puts all the orders in. So he have the summer off or? Nope, he works summer school. He goes to, yep, okay. he goes to work every day. He got his birthday off next week, so that's about it. Other than that, he works all year round. His school is right up on Selby. Alright, I'm a little worried about the trauma caused uh, to your daughter, Deanna. It's very much a lot of trauma. Very much. And I just want you to think about something right now. Um, and I appreciate you talking to me and being candid with me, right? That's what well, it's important that we talk to you. But I may at some point want Deanna to be interviewed uh, by someone that's an expert in talking to kids, and that's neither my partner nor myself. And I could set that up uh, through uh, St. Paul or Minneapolis, maybe set it up through the uh, Midwest Children's Resource Center in St. Paul and, and coordinate that. Would that be okay with you? Okay, and by, and what is, what is That's this? a children's hospital. Okay, I understand that, but why would they want to? Well, I, I, A, for a couple of reasons. Uh, two things come to mind. She's a witness. Absolutely. She's, she's, part of what she's very about. honest. No, she's, and she seems really bright, actually. Yes, she is. A brief conversation I had with her. But I'm, I'm, I want to figure out uh, what she saw in the room, but more importantly, that there is trauma to her. Just the human component of this is what is an acceptable plan to make sure she's not more adversely affected going forward. Fifteen minutes into the interview, finally, one of the detectives showed some ounce of humility and compassion for the trauma inflicted upon Diamond and her four-year-old daughter, Diana, by offering counseling for the child. You also witnessed the lack of trust and suspicion Diamond has for the system. Perhaps she believes it's a covert way for the state of Minnesota to take custody of her child under the guise of helping. What is the best plan? Going there's for? no best plan. There's no best plan. An officer wrongfully shot and hopefully not killed my boyfriend without proper protocol. Okay, but I'm. Worried. There's no way my daughter's going to be able to move forward from this. Feels like her father. Okay. He does everything for her. He picks her up from school. He drops her off at school. He reads her books before bedtime. He wakes up in the morning. There will be no coming from this. He's more her life than her own father. There is no coming back from this. She could talk to all the therapists she needs, but this is not. There's no coming back from this. Diamond, would you be open to that interview or not? I mean, if you want to think about it. I mean, if it's going to help with this case and as far as that officer's concerned because I feel like he needs to be suspended with no pay. He needs, there needs to be some type of consequences. I understand that he has a badge and he has the right to bear arm, but you have the right to bear arm for probable cause. Diamond doesn't seem to understand the importance of trauma counseling for her four-year-old daughter. Detective Strangely didn't offer her counseling as well, which may be why she's apprehensive about having officers focus solely on her child and not the both of them together. Diamond also says she considered the counseling for Deanna if it would aid in the criminal investigation of the officer who shot and killed her fiance. In reality, one has nothing to do with the other. It's extremely understandable for her to be very adamant about seeking justice for what has happened to her family, but she seems to not be able to comprehend just how psychologically devastating Witnessing an event such as murder can be to the psyche of a child, or an adult for that matter. Many people living in high crime and poverty-stricken communities witness traumatic events every day because poverty and its challenges within itself is traumatizing. This trauma sometimes is shouldered for decades without mental help and unfortunately becomes normalized. The detectives seem to understand this, however, Diamond doesn't because her traumas have become normal, everyday occurrences. She's unknowingly willing to pass the trauma down onto her child. That's what we'd like to hear. She's a witness. We'd like mm -hmm. to get that done. And they're, they're professionals. So okay. Can... And, and all, and what's super important going forward is that uh, you try not to, not try not to. You just basically don't talk to her about the details of this. Yeah, and I already told her too. Don't, I don't want her to go to school and telling nobody either. Okay, including conversations with you, and I'll try to set that up for tomorrow. But so we'll be in touch, and um, we'll talk about that more later after the statement. So, 
getting back to the statement, uh, the, the controlled substance or the weed, uh, did that come from you or did that come from Phil? They came from me. It was just some smoking stuff. That's just what I smoke. I go to work every day, you know. No doctors and lawyers that do pot, you know, it's not a big deal. I don't know how much of it it was or okay. anything like that. Yeah, I'm not too concerned with it. I just want to figure out how it got there. So, the other thing, uh, I just want to, this is hard, but I want to go through kind of second by second, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it. So you get pulled over, it's 8.45, roughly, three people in your car. What kind of car was it? Um, a white old school Chevy Caprice. Okay, older sedan. Mm -hmm. And it's really ninety something. It's Phil's or maybe registered. It's Phil's. It's very raggedy. Okay. And the first officer to approach the vehicle was the one that eventually shot, and he approached on the driver's side window. That is correct. And he had what you described as a sixty-second conversation with Phil, uh, wherein he asked, "Do you know why I stopped you?" He, he described the taillight was out. Phil was unaware of that. Um, he asked for license and registration. Phil said, yes, I have that. And then what happened? He told him that he had a firearm on him. And as he was getting back... So let's stop right there. Okay. Did he say that as he was moving his hands to get his license and registration? Yeah. And then as that was motion was happening and he was telling the officer, what did the officer say? Stop moving! Stop moving! Boop, 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 boop. Okay. And it happened that fast. Just like that. This is the third time when Diamond is describing the exact moment of the shooting, she becomes very animated, catching the detectives off guard. She seems to have a lack of concern how she be perceived as mentally unhinged by the detectives. However, she certainly is getting her point across. So, so he only made one motion. He didn't raise his he hands. He didn't do not. He couldn't do. He was like, and. But see, earlier, I'm just trying to make sure that I get this clear. Earlier said he his hands. He started off with his hands in the air because that's how the officer. Well, that's how the traffic stop right. started. Right. Okay. That's how it started. He said, "Put your hands in the air." Well, okay. His hands was in the air. All of our hands was in the air. Do you have license and registration? Yes. Do you have? And he said, "Yes." The traffic stop certainly didn't begin how Diamond claimed it did, with the officer telling Philando to put his hands in the air because at no point, even moments before the shooting, he never instructed Philando to put his hands in the air. However, more than once the officer told Philando not to reach for in regards to the gun Philando informed him of having. And then he said, I As he said yes, and he's going to reach for he said, he was having, you know, mm -hmm. I have a firearm on me. Okay, now you're reaching to the front. Well, seat. you know, I don't know how guys do that, you know, okay. but... He, Just for the benefit of the listener, you're reaching towards the front of your belt. He has it here. He keeps it here. So right above. It's it. not easy. It's easier to get it out if it was right here. He has it. Right in the top of his groin. Yeah. Okay. Right here. And so, and he was reaching in an area you described kind of by the hip bone. Yeah, because that's his back pocket. Okay, so he's reaching. His wallet was in his back pocket. Okay, so he's reaching for what do you think is his back pocket? Right, because he had the license and register. He keeps everything. He has a big fat wallet. He keeps license, registration. He keeps everything in his wallet. Credit cards, money, everything in his wallet. It's a guy thing. I get that. I don't understand it, but he keeps it in there. And he was reaching for it, but it's so damn fat. He couldn't. He sags his pants. He couldn't get the thing out. His thing. So Phil's a big guy. No, he's skinny. Oh, okay. He's skinny as hell. Okay. Tall. All right. Now the detective asks a seemingly unimportant throwaway question when he says, so Phil's a big guy. This is a loaded question because let's say Phil was a big guy. In the mind of these detectives, the general public and the jurors, Phil's size relative to the officer would be seen as intimidating, which would work in the officer who killed him favor because he could use the excuse, I was afraid. This big guy was about to kill me the big scary Negro defense. Just so happens, Phil was tall and very skinny. Um, and so it was just the one motion. Mm -hmm. And did the officer see the weapon or do you think? No, he didn't see it because it wasn't visible. Because he was wearing what kind of clothes? He had a long shirt on. Okay. He had his pants. His back of his pants was sagging because his butt always just out and then his belt where his gun was was actually up to where it needed to be okay okay 
so the extent of the conversation was Phil just offering one time I have a weapon? Yep. What was his exact words? He said, I have a firearm. That was his words. Period. Period. Okay. And then the officer, stop moving. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. He let off more rounds than he let out words. This is a very powerful and profound statement Diamond just made when she said, he let out more rounds than he let out words. This encapsulates just how brief the verbal interaction was before things took a deadly and unexpected turn for the worse. Next, Diamond will make the statement that Philando's last words were, I have a firearm. But according to the video evidence, Phil's last words were, I wasn't reaching. Okay, so the last thing Phil said was, I have a firearm. Okay. As he was trying to reach for that wallet. And you've seen that firearm before? Yeah. You know he carries it? Yeah, he, he don't go nowhere. We make it a joke about it all the time with my, me and my mom. I'm like, Phil carry a gun because he's scary. Oh, he carry a gun because he's soft. He carry a gun because he won't bust a grape. But I live in a high crime neighborhood. Larry, there was been two back? murders in my on, in my backyard. The rainy? Yeah, of course. It's been two murders within the past year and a half. So it's so for protection. It's for my protection, my daughter's protection, and his protection. There's men that sit on my porch smoking drugs all day and all night. I work the night shift. So it's not safe for me and it's not safe for him as a man. He has to protect his family. We live, we're moving. We were, we're moving in August. Do you know how long he's had the permit? Um, a while. Okay. He's had it for a while. Like months or years? No, years. He's had it. I'm pretty sure. He's got practices. Yeah, oh yeah. We went to the range on dates before, all that. Yes. You know what caliber? Uh, nine millimeter. Okay. The moment the detective informs Diamond that Philando has died has arrived, and the callousness and lack of emotional consideration he delivers the news, quite frankly, is appalling, which is on par with their interaction with Diamond throughout the entire interview. But surprisingly more shocking is how Diamond's demeanor strangely changes from crying to casual in an instant. Is that the only one? Yeah. Only one, yes. Okay. That he's ever had around me. You know, what kind of gun was the manufacturer? No, I don't know the manufacturer. I just know it's a nine. It's black. I don't touch it. I don't hold it. I don't... Have you shot it at the range? No, we have... He shoots his gun and he buys one for me to or rent, rent one. For him? Yeah. Okay. Uh, he likes to shoot his own stuff. Alright. But it was not visible. His shirt was covering it. He had a belt on. It wasn't it wasn't able it wasn't out. It was not visible. Okay. So So what they say? Because I know you just got the text. Yeah, I think I got I don't think it was Phil's died. I got some bad news. And I'm sorry it happened. Uh, Did he say anything after he was shot? He didn't say anything. His eyes rolled in the back of his head and he just looked at me. Okay. He said anything. There was nothing to say. I'm really sorry. It's terrible. His officer got to go home to his family. He took him away from us. He'll be right to you. He's not fair. He's not fair. Please get me out of here. We can do that. How would you like to uh, be taken to the hospital? Do you have a... I don't have any ride. They took my cell phone, my house keys. I don't even know how I'm getting home. In the we'll get that stuff back to you, your cell phone. We'll get that back to you. I want to go to the hospital so I can see him for the last time. Um, house keys, you said they took those? They got my purse. They got everything. Can we call someone right now, Diamond? I don't have any numbers to call anyone. Okay, I can maybe send a squad car over to a house and uh, have someone communicate with you. There's no house to go to. I don't have nobody but my boyfriend. I don't have nobody. No, my mom lives in a different state. He was all I had. 
no family. No family, but my sister who was at the scene. Where did she go to? I don't know. They took my phone. They, I didn't even get to talk to her. Okay, so you need your keys to get back into your apartment. And sure. I need my phone for sure to call people. Okay. Your sister who was dropped off before the traffic stop? Yes. Okay. She came back once I got on Facebook. And they found out where I was and came. So she came back in So she wasn't there. They killed, he killed him. So now what? Where do we go from here? Because there's going to be lawsuits going to be in order. There's discrimination and there's racism. There's a lot of things that's going to play now because of this. So here's what Mike and I and what our colleagues do is we go and we do interviews and we talk to everyone and then we have a crime scene team at the scene of this event and they're going to uh, do a full forensic well, make sure they don't remove his gun off of him and try to make it seem like something that it wasn't because I already know how the system is. I already know how they tamper with evidence. I already know how they do. In so many words, what Diamond is saying is that she's aware how it's been discovered that many police officers have planted or rearranged evidence in order to support their claim a shooting was justified. She makes the statement, make sure they don't take his gun off of him. Meaning, don't reposition Philando's gun in an attempt to make it appear as if he was actively attempting to fire upon the officer as a way to falsely justify the killing. And they took a life. You guys' department, your police... We don't, we don't work for the Well, department. okay, I'm sorry. The people who are supposed to serve and protect us took an innocent man's life today. Nine days before his birthday. Yep, that's a fact, and that's sad, and we're, we're sorry about it. And our job is to find out what happened. I want that. I hope that police officer is going to be fired or something's going to happen with no pay. He should not be allowed to be still working if he don't know how to control his feelings, his emotions, and anything that has to do with taking innocent people's lives. Immediately after the shooting, Officer Geronimo Yanez was placed on paid administrative leave, which is common in these circumstances. However, he was subsequently fired from the St. Anthony Police Department after he was acquitted of the homicide just over a year later. And if that's found to be true, then there'll be a, some sort of training, punishment, who knows what. But that's after the investigation. And when we're done with the investigation, we give it to the... Ramsey County Prosecutor, and then they're going to have a grand jury, and they'll figure out what happened. So there's a lot of evidence we have to go through. So how do you figure... Guns, the bullets, the cameras, whether cameras rolling, your phone has to be analyzed, because we got to pull that video off of your phone. All that evidence together is how we get a full picture, and the interview with you and oh, your Oh, well, that the video ain't saved. It's just on Facebook. Oh, it got posted immediately? Yeah. And it didn't get the shooting itself? It was yeah. right after? Yeah, it was after. Okay, but it still will provide some... Because uh, he told us, he told me the moves, I couldn't pick my phone up in the midst of him doing yep. that because yep. he would have shot me too, shit. Okay. All right, well, we're going to, I got to go find out where your purse is so we can get you your keys and get back to your apartment. Your phone, we're going to have to take it and download. Uh, even though you say it's posted immediately, the phone still is kept in your flash memory. Uh, well, I have an iPhone. It's not. You know how Facebook goes live? Oh, yeah. I went live. Okay, well, we'll take a look. So you can just Facebook. You don't have to take my phone because it's not saved into the memory. iPhone don't. Y'all have iPhones. Yeah. If you go for live on Facebook, that live video don't save to your phone. It only is on Facebook. Okay. And then once it gets shared, it's, you know how that goes. Okay. All right. I'm going to uh, end the tape portion of the statement. Before I do, is there anything else uh, that's important for me to know as an investigator that, that we haven't talked about or mentioned? There's nothing important other than he wrongfully killed a man and asked two questions at one time. Can I see your hands? Can I see your license and registrations? As far as you know, there's no previous dealings between Phil and either one of his officers. No, he never seen that man a day in his life. Okay. Right, the time is now uh, 23, 48 hours. Um, I'm going to find out about your first time where it is. In my phone. Would you do me a favor? I know uh, this is hard. I know you're in pain. Um, you're in a child protection worker, so I worry about kids. And I, I, nothing we can do about what's already happened, but there's things we can do to make it worse. And um, I, I just want you to really... He died on the scene. 
Yeah, I think they loaded them in an ambulance and transported them. I tried to provide them. Um, but uh, the word I just got was that they just dismissed. So, but what I'd like you to consider, and I know this is just a lot going on in your brain, but I'm going to get a hold of you tomorrow, and I, and I want to set up an appointment to have her uh, interviewed as a witness, but more importantly, I want mom, you, to talk to the medical staff who's dealt with kids that have had trauma before, and they can get advice for parents on how not to make it worse. Uh, because we can't undo what's been done. Uh, that's not an option. But we can. But he still gets to go home to his family. He has no worries. Well, he gets to come back to work as if he didn't take a life for no reason. I know the truth. Again, for the second time, the detective offers trauma counseling for Diamond's four-year-old daughter, and she gives a rebuttal that has nothing to do with the offer of psychological help Diana will need. In the middle of offering help, Diamond begins asking why does Officer Yanez get to go home instead of jail? This is a very strange disconnect she seems to have when the conversation of therapy comes up. We're, you know, we investigate, we collect, we gather facts, and we are uh, thorough. And, and we, we, uh, if he broke the law, he's going to be accountable. And that's all there is to it. Right? Um, I can't believe my boyfriend's home. It's a 10-year relationship? Yes. I okay. haven't been with anybody. So if you he don't didn't deserve that, this. If you don't mind me asking how your daughter's four or five, so was there a break in the relationship? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. And you guys yeah. got back together? Yeah, we got back together. And you guys planning to get married right? Yes, we was. Also having kids. Okay. Yes, we was. In this awkward exchange, the officer asks Diamond for clarification if she and Philando were in a 10-year relationship. And Diamond's reply is odd, to say the least, when she responds by confirming that her and Philando have been together for 10 years. And for some reason, she says, I haven't been with anyone else. Now, this causes the detective to challenge her on that because it's already known that Diamond's daughter isn't Phil's biological child, and she's four years old, which means she, in fact, had been with another man at some point within the relationship. Did he grow up in St. Paul? Yes, he did. So let me ask you some questions about this family. Uh, do you really know anything about his parents? Yes, his mom is in his life. His sister is a doctor. What's his mom's name? His, her name is um, Valerie Castillo in Robbinsdale, Minnesota. How old is she? Probably like 50 or something. Does she work? Yes. She? I'm not sure. And then the sister of the doctor, what's her name? Alizé Castillo. How do you spell that name? I, I like the liquor, Alizé. I don't know. I mean, neither A L A Z Y. I don't know, but my boyfriend's dead. L L A Z, and then the last name? Castillo. Castillo. Okay, so she's not married. Um, and she's a doctor. Where? She does. I can't even think straight. I don't know. Somewhere in the compartment. Oh my God. Uh, in the meantime, can you refrain from talking to Deanna about this particular event? Um, well, about the fact that he's dead, he's well, never coming you back. You can talk about death, and you can talk about him coming back. And she asks questions, so you, know, you can answer them. But I'm, I'm not trying to. I'm trying to make sure we don't spoon feed her what to say. Uh, cause she's gonna have a. Oh yeah, I'm gonna talk to her. Okay. About the details of this. Mm -hmm. She's her mind is too young to really yeah. intellectually get around any of this right now. So all she needs from you is love. She's charming and delightful. And, uh, it's, what I'm asking you to do is incredibly hard, uh, is, is to be strong for your daughter. Uh, but that would be my preference uh, for the sake of her. And you have my assurance that uh, Agent uh, Mike Phil and I. Uh, Nobody gave me. That's how I know y'all don't care about us. Y'all don't give us business cards, sure. nothing, okay. just nothing. Oh my God. I think I handed you one when I met you. No, no, no. Okay. no. Okay. Um, would you like one from Mike too? Yes, I want one from everyone. I want the officer's badge number that shot my boyfriend. I want his name. I don't have that right now. I, I didn't even notice so it. I came straight here. So, um, let me see if we bring you back in that other room.
In the end, as mentioned before, Officer Geronimo Yanez was acquitted on all charges leveled against him. In 2022, Yanez attempted to become a substitute teacher. However, he was denied due to the widespread outcry of the community and because the head of the education board deemed his behavior regarding the shooting as abhorrent and unbefitting of an educator. Years after the shooting, Diamond got into some legal trouble of her own involving a fight with another female. That case was dismissed and soon after, she was granted a settlement of more than $500,000 for psychological damages inflicted upon her and her child. Today, her and her daughter Deanna seem to be thriving and doing as well as anyone could considering the tragic events of that fateful night in 2016. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight to go over this very important case that's pretty close to me personally. Um, if you don't mind, please leave a like and subscribe. The next video is coming out soon. Stay tuned.